If you turn your Bibles over to Judges chapter 6, <clears throat> Judges chapter 6, and uh, I'm getting to the place, I only have about two or three more Sundays on You Were Made for More, but I hope you realize you were made for more. Wherever you're at, you know, the, the Bible tells us that we can always obtain more. So I don't care where you're at, as, as good as life is, you can get more. As bad as life, I want you to know there's going to be more, and it's very important. So in our pursuit of more of God in our lives, have you ever sensed that God is trying to do something new in your life, and you find yourself like a trial lawyer that says, I object? Anybody ever been there besides me? God is trying to pull you a little bit further life, and you say, I object. Many times we don't do this to be difficult, okay? We don't do this to be defiant. We believe that we have valid reasons not to step out in faith and obedience to what God is calling us to do. Our reservations, many times mine have been very logical, okay? At least in my own mind. But because God loves us and wants the best for us to come in our lives, God responds to your I object to objection overturned you ever been there before come on i think every one of us have you you tell the lord you're like perry mason okay you're gonna have your perry mason moment and all of a sudden the judge says objection overturned okay or overruled please turn your bibles over to judges chapter six and we're going to go into verse 11 and this is a story about Gideon. And you know, and I really would encourage you to, to read your Bible and, to, and read to your kids' Bible stories. It's amazing in life that we're growing up with a generation of young people that, I hate to say this, many of them are Bible illiterate, okay? Because they're not reading their Bible and they're doing, you know, I've always thought, isn't it amazing? Ever, I, I like watching Jeopardy. And you know, they'll tell you 13th century French poets and they can go through that thing and they get every one of them right. And then they get to the Bible and they leave it alone. It's the last category. And I think, I don't even know any 13th century French people anyway. Hallelujah. You know what I'm saying? And so, you know, and I want to encourage you as parents. I know some of you are doing a great job. Some of you maybe are struggling. You know what? It's just time to say, you know what? We're going we're gonna to read about stories. And today we're going to read about a story about Gideon. And these are more than just stories. These are inspirations for us. Because we're going to find out Gideon thought he had a lot, he was very logical in telling the Lord, I object. But the Lord told Gideon, objection overruled. So we're going to start in, in chapter 6 and verse 11. And it reads, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in, uh, in Ophrah, not Oprah, Ophrah, okay, that belonged to Joash the Abzizite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press to keep it from the Midianites. So here we find out here that, that God comes and visits Gideon. Okay? Gideon promptly voices his irritation. We're going to see this with the Lord. And he has four objections when God tells him what he wants to do. In verse 12, it says, When the angel of the Lord appeared unto Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Up to this point, really, you know what Gideon was? He was a coward, okay? And I'm not telling you he didn't have good reason to be coward. Where did they find Gideon? Where was he at? He was threshing wheat in the wine press. You know why he was threshing wheat in the wine press? Because the Midianites were raiding the, the Israelites at this time, and they would wait till all the crops were about ready to be harvested. They would wait for all this, and they'd swoop in and steal everything. So Gideon was trying to make a living for his family, but he knew if he did it out in the open, in the pub, out in the open public, that the Midianites would see him and they'd come and steal everything he had. So he says, I'm going to do this where no one can see me. Does that sound like a mighty man of valor? I don't think so, okay? But isn't it amazing? God had more for Gideon. See, Gideon thought he was going to be relegated to just threshing wheat in a wine press. And God says, I'm going to use you to defeat the enemy. God made him for more. Look what it says in verse 13. This is Gideon's first objection to God. But I love what Gideon says to the, to the angel Lord. He says, but sir, you know, I remember when I was coaching basketball. And, and I would, and if I wasn't getting the calls I wanted to, and I, I would never cuss and swear at the official. I wouldn't, okay? But what I would always do when he'd come by, I would do. I'd say, but sir, I would call the official sir. 
But sir, I need the same call down here as you're given down here, down there. I say, but sir, and I'd always call him sir. You don't get technicals for calling the official sir, okay? <laughs> and so we're finding out here, Gideon uh, tells the angel Lord, he says, but sir. Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. I've encountered people like this on a regular basis who like Gideon Gideon, are just a little upset with Jesus. Have you ever thought, yeah, Lord, if it's so good, why is this happening to me? You ever talk to anybody that maybe once were churchgoers and something happened bad in their life, and they want to say, where is God now? You know what, folks? We're not alone in that. Do you understand? We know this. What does the devil come to do? Steal, kill, and destroy. And so there is a spiritual battle going on here, okay? But we need to find out. You know what? They will say, you know what? God hasn't come through for me. He seems to help other people in other places, but not me. Have you ever ever felt that way yourself? How about, don't you think maybe some of the people at Nibrera, and maybe the people at Norfolk, and maybe some of these other towns, do you know there are some really good Christian people that got flooded and lost everything? You know that? Don't you think maybe their thoughts said, but Lord, where are you? Where are you? Okay? I tell you what, I felt that way, and I'm sure all of us have felt that way in times. Others get their prayers answered, but for some reason, mine seem to get ignored. They try to tell, you know, they try to tell me that God isn't paying attention, and if he is, he's shown up too late to do any good. See, the main problem, the main problem for these people is often the case is they are short-sighted, or they are actually, they have a limited perspective. How do I know, folks? Because there have been times in my life I thought God had forsaken me. And then when you walk away from it, come on, anybody with any age, when you walk away from it, you can look back and you think, you know, I was being short-sighted. I was trying to look at everything with a snapshot, and God has a motion picture going on. Here, all this, you know, what Satan meant for evil, God was going to turn into good. Don't you think when Joseph was sold by his brothers and thrown into the pit and then sold to Egypt, that he thought, where are you, God? But then what? Yeah, decades later, he found out in that sh- in his short sightedness, he thought God had abandoned him. No, God was actually orchestrating his life so he could save the nation of Israel and his parents. And so many times I have found out as I've gotten a little bit older in life, I don't try to judge everything quite too quick. Because you know what? You don't know what your crop is going to be in the fall, in the springtime. How many times have you heard people, oh, it's going to be a terrible... Farmers, bless their hearts, okay? My grandparents were both farmers. They're some of the most pessimistic people in the world. You know that? All oh, the crops aren't going to be good this year. You know, and, and I'll never forget my grandpa. You know, he'd always complain when he had a good crop because the, the price was low. And he'd always complain when he had a bad crop because the price was high. I said, Grandpa, that's Econ 101. But you know what? We just need to realize that, you know what? Yes, we're going to go through some valleys and some hilltops, but we need to know that God is in control, okay? And God has something more for us. And many times we don't experience that more till a little bit later on in life, okay? Too many times we're quick to blame God for being unavailable. We, like Gideon, believe God has abandoned us. While in fact, it's the other way around. In verse 14, it says, The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. And uh, am I not sending you? I love that. See, some questions and complaints don't get an answer. Gideon said, God, what about this? What about that? And you know what God said? Go in the strength and, and deliver Israel. God didn't even address his complaints. Doesn't that get you mad sometimes? God, I got a legitimate complaint here, and I want you to answer it. You're not, you're ignoring it and telling me to do something else. Don't you realize I got problems? God says, you know what? You have problems, but I'm going to help you be more than you ever thought you could. Amen? Any parent knows this. You know that? Has your kids ever asked you something? Mom, what about this? What about that? Dad, you say, go clean your room. Wait, wait, that's not what I to- asked you. I asked you, could I go out Friday night with my friends, and you told me, go clean your room. 
No. See, some things, that your parents, you don't have to answer. Do you understand what I'm saying? And you're telling them, you know what? I made you for more. God did this with Gideon. Gideon wanted God to answer his complaints, and I think they were valid in his own heart. But God says, I'm not even going to answer them. I'm going to send you off to do something more. And that's very, very important. God's first response to Gideon's first objection is to get back and to get back to the main subject of what God wanted Gideon to do. See, Gideon, God said, you mighty man of valor. What was God's plan for Gideon? God wanted Gideon to be a deliverer for the nation. Gideon was complaining about everything else. And God says, I'm not getting off track here. Gideon, I didn't come here to listen to you complain about you. I abandoned you. I came here, here to empower you to become more than what you could be. And you know what? Sometimes as parents, isn't that what we have to do with our kids? You know, we, we, they want to get sidetracked on this. And we said, no, let's bring them right back on the tracks so they can be what God has called them to be. See, never mind rehashing the past. There is a job to get done and let's do it. Amen. Some people stay in the past all their life. You know, I, I can't do this. I can't do that because of this and that. I'm saying, you know what? You got to get over it. You got to get over it in life. You know, there are some things I know happen in all of our lives. None of us are immune to things, okay? Well, I'm sure every one of us have been betrayed by somebody, okay, that hurt deep. So then what we have to decide in life, are we going to ever trust anybody again? I have news for you. Life's pretty hard if you're not going to trust anybody, okay? You might as well go buy an island somewhere and live out there, okay? Because we, but we've all had to go through those things. And if we let... You learn from the past, but you don't live in the past, okay? Look at what it says in verse 16. This is the second objection of Gideon's to the Lord. In verse 16, then the Lord answered and said, I will be with you. Wait, uh, uh, verse 15. But Lord, Gideon said, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The 12 tribes of Israel, Manasseh was the weakest of the 12 tribes, and Gideon said, and he was the weakest of Manasseh. So what's he really trying to do with the Lord? Give him another, I object. And what is God going to say? Objection overruled. Have you ever noticed when you get in an argument with God, he wins? It's kind of like arguing as a kid with your parents, they win. You know why? They have a little more wisdom than that, okay? It says, what, he, what is he basically saying here is, I don't have the right connections. Gideon is sure that God needs someone who is better qualified and connected than he is, and his resume doesn't look as impressive as others. His reference list is a little short. The joint chief of staffs don't even know who he's, he exists. Remember, he came to Gideon and said, you mighty man of valor. Gideon says, the, the chief of staff doesn't even know who I am. He's given all these reasons why. What Gideon focuses on is not God's omnipotent power, but is the insignificance of his life and his family. What was God's response to Gideon? Verse 16. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. Once again, Gideon says, I object. And once again, the king says, objection overruled. Are you starting to get a little history here? That every time we think we got a really good reason not to do something, God says, I got a better reason you can. See, every time Gideon was saying, I don't have the resources, I don't have the education, I don't have all these things. And God says, it's not about you. It's about God's omnipotent power in you. Does that make sense? Because, see, we want to try to do all these things in our own strength and our own power. And God is saying, no, it's not, I'm not trying. It's, in fact, the apostle Paul put it this way. He says, not many that are called are the most intelligent, are the strongest, are all this. God's saying, I'm using the weak to confound the wise. So if you want to tell me that you're not highly educated, if you want to tell me you don't have the right connections, if you want to tell me, give me all these excuses, I'm going to say, you're setting yourself up for God. Hallelujah. He's going to come in and use you. God was telling Gideon, and he's telling us today, you, ha you don't have to have the right connections. You know why? You have Jesus. You know, I think of how God brought Meryl and I here, the Christ the King. You know how many people I knew in Ponca two years ago? Zero. Do you, do you know, you know, 
Two years ago, do you think I knew where Ponca was? No. Do you think two years ago I thought I was going to come and live in Nebraska? No. Didn't. I didn't have any connections. Do you understand what I'm saying? But God had a connection. And God says the steps of a righteous person are ordered by the Lord. And you know, see, I didn't have to have the right connections in life. I just had to be connected with Jesus. And because there was a group of people in Ponca, Nebraska, that were praying and saying, Lord, we need a pastor that will lead and guide and direct us through your power and your spirit. I, 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 there's a pastor in Arizona saying, Lord, get me out of the desert. Hallelujah. Okay, you know what I'm saying? Now, you laugh. That, that I lived in the Mojave Desert. The desert, Okay. You know, behold, I, you tread upon serpents and scorpions. That was us, hallelujah. The serpents and the scorpions. And God brought us together. And I'll never forget that. It was in May, okay, of 2017 was the first time I had contact. I still came after talking to Ron, hallelujah. You know that? <laughs> I still came, hallelujah, okay? I think it helped me. He passed me off to Brenda. Okay, and Brenda, uh, okay, you know. <clears throat> but, you know, see, you don't have to always have the right connections. You're connected with Jesus. Amen? He's saying, I'm your source. I'm the one. We sing that song, Jesus, you're all I need. See, really in life, Jesus is all we really need. All we need to get closer to, that's my passion in life. That's what Meryl and I are doing, you know, and I'm so grateful for Beth and, and, and for uh, Kay, okay, yeah, I think it's Stan, but, you know, we like Stan too, but, but really, for Edge, I'm grateful for, for uh, Casey and Amanda and for uh, Reed and Amy and for the people that are involved with our Sunday school workers downstairs and all this. I'm so grateful for the people because we have a passion to want to get people closer to Jesus. Because you know what? All these other things really don't matter in life. I bet you there's nobody sitting on his deathbed saying, I wish I would have invested in a different 401k. No. You know what? When you're getting closer to heaven, you're going to make sure Jesus is a priority. And I'm saying, why should we wait till then? Why, you know, Jesus said, I've come that you might have an abundant and abundant life here on this earth. I want to enjoy life. I want to enjoy Jesus now. Amen. And so we need to realize God has made us for more. Amen. See, the key to victory is not who you know on a first name basis, how many phone calls or emails, okay, or addresses you've collected, what associations you're members of, or what credentials hang on your wall. The key to victory belong, is that we belong to God. And we can be confident that he knows perfectly what the future holds. He is not depending on your credentials. Rather, we need to be depending upon his calling in our life. There's nothing wrong with going to college. You know, I tell people I'm highly educated. I just don't act like it. I'm okay with that life, okay? I got degrees. I got all that stuff. You know, I met some people that have so many degrees, you could call them Mr. Fahrenheit. You know what I'm saying? You know, all these things. I don't care about those things. I want to know who you are with Jesus. Because someday, folks, we're going to stand before Jesus, and he's going to talk to us. And, you know, and we can pop out and say, you know, you know, we just saw this big college scandal thing. What does college really mean sometimes? I, I'm still trying to figure out, I thought college was expensive enough paying for it, let alone pay a half a million dollars to get your kid into it. Hallelujah. I'm thinking, heck, I just give him a half a million and tell him to stay out of college, okay? I can at least, I can at least keep the tuition money to myself, then, you know? But we just need to make sure in life that what? We know we belong to Jesus. See, we're confident that he holds the future. Look at what it says in Psalm 23, verse 1. A verse we're all very familiar with. It says, the Lord is what? My shepherd. I shall not be in vain. Okay? I shall not be in want. Excuse me. The Lord is my shepherd. See, a shepherd takes care of his sheep. Derek just got back from... Western Nebraska, having a vacation out there for about three weeks, four weeks, you know. Only had about 120 calves out there and 18 inches of snow and blowing weather. What a joy being a farmer, hallelujah, you know, a rancher. I tell you what, you know, them ranchers, they got it so easy in life, don't they? You know, you just have the cows, they have the calves, they take care of themselves. You sell them, you make money. It's a great deal, hallelujah, okay? Talk to Derek, okay? He'll take you out there, okay? You know what I'm saying? But the fact of the matter is what? It says... The rancher, Derek, is going to take care of his cattle. Jesus is our shepherd. He's going to take care of us as sheep. 
We don't have to worry about it. You know, I bet you those cows out there, they're not thinking, I wonder if dairy's going to feed us today. Nope. You know what they probably do? They go up to the trough, and there's hay there. There's grain there. There's whatever. He's made a commitment. See, feeding those cattle isn't dependent upon their want. It's upon the rancher. See, folks, it's not in our power and our strength. It's not in our resources. It's in God's. In fact, Paul wrote in Philippians, he said, My God shall supply all your needs according to his, re- his, sor- his resources in heaven, in Christ Jesus. See, it's not about us. It's about him. Some people will do anything to avoid taking a risk. Have you ever heard these excuses? I'm too old. Oh, I'm too young. Okay? I haven't received the proper training. I have physical limitations. How about, I'm a woman. How about, I'm a man. I don't have the time. You know what? The list goes on. And every time we do that, you know what Jesus does? Objection overruled. If you're too young and too old, what's that make you? I don't know. Hallelujah. Okay. You know, I, I remember when Meryl and I, when, when, we, when we first got involved with the ministry and people would say, oh, you know, you're just too young for this. Okay, you know, da, 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 da. You know, and then when you get older, it says, oh, you're too old. I don't want you. I'll, you know, I'm talking, wait, what happened here? Okay. And the fact of the matter is, you know what? God says, don't make excuses. He has you right where he wants you. When God thrusts you into a new sphere of ministry and blessings to others, we simply have to take God at his word, trusting and obeying regardless of the what ifs and regardless of our fears. You know what, folks? When you step out, there are some fears out there. There are some what ifs. Lord, what happens if it doesn't work? Well, you know what? It might not, but you know what? You'll never know. And I've said this, folks. This is how I live my life. I would rather fail at doing something than succeed at doing nothing. Come on. That was good. (laughs) That was good. Okay, there you go. I would rather fail at doing something than succeed at doing nothing. And we need to realize that, okay? You and I were made for more. So you fail. Big deal. You get up and you go again. Amen? I tell you what, it's better than being those namesayers sitting back in the stands. You know what I'm saying? Say, I would have done this. You wouldn't have done that. You could have done that, but you chose not to. So you know what? When we get out there and we fail, if we're going to fail, you know what I tell people? Fail forward, not fail backwards. Fail forwards, okay? Very, very important. See, if we never take the first step, you know what happens? We can't take the second step. Don't focus, though, on the second step. Focus on the first step. Gideon didn't go out and challenge the Midianites the next day. He started smaller. We're going to look at this. He knocked down, I don't know if this was any easier, but he knocked down an idolatrous altar in his father's courtyard, first and undercover. Let's go over, let's go down to verse 25. So God comes along and tells Gideon, you know what, Gideon, you mighty man of valor, you're going to, you're going to lead the nation of Israel out of its bondage. And and Gideon says, oh, I don't know about that. God said, we're going to start small. So here Gideon, God says, you know what? Your daddy, everybody say daddy. Your daddy has an altar to Baal, which is a false god. I want you to go in there, and I want you to tear it down at night. (laughs) Gideon wasn't too thrilled about that, okay? Let's go down into verse 25. That same night the Lord said to him, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. I mean, this second bull, this is the one that's in training. Seven years, this is a prized bull. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's, this is like a John Deere tractor, brand new one that's really starting to just get broke in. He said, take this bull, and it says, tear down your father's uh, altar to Baal, cut down the Asherah pole. Actually, that's a totem pole. Okay, that's what it means. Okay, beside it, uh, he said, then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord, uh, to the Lord your God. Can you imagine this? Here, you're, you're scared. You're, you're threshing wheat in the wine press so nobody sees you. God comes up. I mean, you're just having, you know, you're just having this very typical, normal, miserable life, but you like it that way. You know, isn't it easier to complain sometimes and do something about it? Come on. Oh, God, where are you now? You know, but then when God comes along and says, let's change it. No, 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 no. I like my wine press. Hallelujah. Okay, you know what I'm saying? 
So then all of a sudden, God gets him to be a little bit more, and he says, okay, we're going to defeat the Midianites. And Gideon's thinking, man, I don't think so. And God says, okay, we'll start smaller. Has God ever tricked you a little bit? And Gideon's thinking, good, I get to start something smaller. Now you're going to go tear down your daddy's altar. <laughs> Have you ever told your parents something they didn't want to hear? Colson, you're too young. Hallelujah. Okay, you know what I'm saying? He says, see, Gideon's dad was a worshiper of false idols. And God says, you know what? We're going to start tearing down the altars in your family. And Gideon wasn't too sure about this. So you know what Gideon did? And I don't blame him. He did it at night. <laughs> he did it at night so nobody would see him. And you can just imagine, we're not going to go to the whole story, but I'd, I encourage you to read it. When, can you imagine what Gideon's dad did when he got up the next morning? Oh, good. Somebody tore down my, my God. No, his dad was mad. And they wanted to get after Gideon. You know what God's telling you? You got to start small. Okay? So many times people think, I, you know, God's called me to do this big thing. Yes, he has. But you start off small. I, I've always said it this way. When we start off, have nickel faith will get you nickel miracle. And when you get a nickel miracle, then you'll get dime faith. And when you get dime faith, you get a dime miracle. And when you, have, you get that dime miracle, maybe you get a quarter faith then you get a quarter miracle do you understand what i'm saying it's very biblical it says that you keep building line upon line and precept upon precept but what's in trouble in life is when we're not using our faith and we think we can do it all of ourselves. and when god gives wants to give us a nickel miracle we don't want to use our nickel faith we want to do it ourselves. and maybe we get what we want but we didn't use our faith then all of a sudden maybe down the line we got a 25 cent miracle that we need but we don't have 25 cent faith you know why it wasn't that god overwhelmed you but we didn't use our faith to build up to that because God sees everything coming down the line amen and so we need to be able to do more and have the more in our lives okay so we find out that what Gideon went out and did this see if you're always giving excuses about why you can't do anything or why you can't do something you'll never do anything okay objection number three he says would you please give me a sign you know I don't act this is called a fleece a fleece Okay, a fleece was in the Old Testament. I would not recommend using a fleece in the New Testament because the Bible tells us that in Romans 8 that those that are led by God's Spirit are his sons and daughters. Okay, but in the Old Testament, God's Spirit did not live inside people. God's Spirit would come and visit upon them, the Bible tells us, but God's Spirit didn't live into uh, live inside of them. And so they would ask for signs that would give them an assurance that they were doing what God wanted them to do here, okay? So Gideon said, would you give me a sign, okay? But Gideon decided to put God to a clear-cut test, okay? And I have this in my notes. We ought to be able to take God at his word alone without asking him to prove anything, okay? Look what it says in, in Judges chapter 6. We're going to go verse 36. It says, Gideon said to the Lord, if you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, I will know that you will save Israel by my hand as you said. And that is, and, and, and that is what happened. Gideon rose early the next morning. He squeezed the fleece and wrung it out the dew and, and, and bowl full of water. So Gideon came along and said, God, if you're really talking to me, I'm going to put a, a piece of wool out there, and, you know, the dew will come in and soak up. Instead of dew everywhere, it'll just be on the wall. And so, you know what God did? God said, okay, Gideon, I can do that. And so Gideon got up the next morning, and he, and he squeezed it out, okay? But you know what? Gideon is a lot like you and me. After God showed himself strong on the behalf of Gideon, you know what Gideon said? I got one more test for you, God. Come on. Have we ever been there? You know, we've asked God to show himself strong. He shows himself strong, and we think, wait, 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 how about one more thing? So we're going to find out what Gideon did here, okay? So objection number four was, how about another sign? Maybe Gideon was thinking maybe God was just lucky. Maybe it was just happened to be lucky to do win on, on the fleece there, okay? And now he wanted to prove it again. So let's go down in verse 39. Then, the, then Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me. You know, can you imagine that? I'm sure God's saying, well, Gideon, Gideon, Gideon. Have you ever talked with your kids and they want to keep giving you excuses? You know, well, how about about this? If you do this not, and you do it, they say, well, how about this? And Gideon knew he was treading on. He said, God, don't get mad at me, okay? Okay? Let me make just one more request. <laughs> 
Allow me one more test with the fleece. This time make the fleece dry and the ground covered with dew. That, that night God did so. Only the fleece was dry and all the ground was covered with dew. I don't want to get on Gideon's case too much because we're all like Gideon. But Gideon says, first God, just make the fleece dry in the ground. Or the fleece wet and the ground dry. And he did it. And he said, maybe he was lucky. Let's see. Now, God, I want you to make the ground wet and the fleece dry. And God did those things. Okay? See, the Lord, it says in Psalm 103, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. It would have been easy for God to give up on Gideon, but he didn't. And you know what, saints of God, he's not going to give up on you. With each excuse we offer to Almighty God, he gives us grace and mercy. Be able to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Surely love and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. I'm telling you, see, God isn't trying to push you and I out to hurt us. He's trying to push you and I out out of our comfort zone so we can do the more that he created us for. God has big plans for every one of us. And those plans are good plans, okay? For each of us to reach our promised land or the more that God has for us, we should be like his disciples. It's kind of interesting. We won't turn to these verses, but the disciples only asked the Lord of two things. In Luke chapter 1, 11, verse 1, the disciples asked the Lord to teach them to pray. And in Luke chapter 17, verse 5, they asked that their faith be increased. Those are the only two things his disciples ever asked him. Lord, teach me to pray and help my faith to grow. Teach me to pray and help my faith to grow. And you know what? If we'll ask the Lord to teach us to pray and ask us for our faith to grow, we're going to be able to do the more. When we learn to pray like Jesus and exhibit his faith, we will be getting the focus off of ourselves. We'll be getting it on him. Faith is a conviction down in our soul that God can be trusted to do what he said he can do. Let God's promises possess you. Let God's plan possess you. And let God's power possess you. Let his promises, his plan, and his power possess you. Then you and I can do more. Whatever God's direction is for you, uh, for you in, your new, in your life, if, if it seems scary at first, then I know it's God's. Okay? We need to surrender to his purposes. He will be right there with us everywhere he leads because we were made for more. You know, I would just tell you this. You know, when Marilyn and I got ready to move to Ponca a year and a half ago, it was kind of scary, okay? It was kind of scary. But Marilyn and I, we love Ponca. We love Ponca and the greater Ponca area. We are so blessed to be here. Okay, I want you to know, we're blessed to be in northeastern Nebraska. So many people maybe want to talk about it, say, why would you want to live there? Why wouldn't you want to live here? You know, the types of people we have here are wonderful people, people that love Jesus, people that love their neighbors, people are trying to help each other. Do you understand that? And I tell people, but it was scary at first. It was scary at first. But you know what? See, God doesn't call us to do things that we're comfortable with. Because if we were comfortable with it, why would we need God? He calls us to trust in him. Have faith in him. That, you know what? You and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Amen? We were made for more. We're going to have the worship team come on up, please. And you know, as they're coming up, I want you to stand up, please.